All right. Ready for a children's story? I am too. Whoa. Well, I, this is my treasure. I keep my treasures in here. Yeah, I've got treasures in here. Uh, I don't know. I don't really, I think I'll, I'll share it with you guys, all right? I'll share it with you. Well, the first one, let's see. I got, let's see, what do I got in? Oh, boy, oh boy, this is, I'm telling you, I don't know what I would do without these. Shoes. You all got shoes on. Different kind of shoes. There's dress shoes. There's tennis shoes, right? There's walking shoes. There's running shoes. Uh, you name it. There's shoes for everything. There's shoes for track and field. There's shoes for football. There's shoes for everything, isn't it? Did you ever think what the world would be if everybody went barefooted? Ooh. I'm telling you, we'd have a lot of foot problems, wouldn't we? But, you know, when I was young, I used to go barefooted all the time when in the spring and the summer I could not wait to get my shoes off. Do you know what I was always doing? I was getting thorns in my feet. Yeah, I had to get those thorns out. Or I would stub my big toe all the time. But, you know, I grew up, and I just love these things. Shoes, that's, that's one of my treasures. Now, I got some more treasures in here. Let's see, what do we got in here? Let's see. Oh, my. Let's see. Oh. Hmm. What's that remind you of? And what did Jesus do? Yeah, he died. Mm -hmm. And washed away our sins. Right. He gave his life that we might have life everlasting. That's very precious, isn't it? So when we see crosses, that reminds us of Jesus and his death. Now I got something else in here. Hang on, let's see. Oh, over here. This I keep, I keep all by itself in here. This is, I tell you, this is one of the most precious. It is the most precious treasure I got. You know what it is? You want to guess? It's a Bible. Because this is God's love letter to me and to you. Ah, to the whole world, isn't it? It's his love letter to us. It helps us to understand what God is really like. And I've got something else in here that is a very precious treasure. Oh, I like this. I don't know what I, don't know what I would do without this. I bet you don't know either. I bet you wouldn't know what to do without it. I tell you. Yeah, I'm here. Mirror, yeah. Have you ever stood in front of a mirror and uh, made fun? Funny faces? Yeah, right, make some. Yeah, right. Make some. Look really scared. <gasps> Can you do that? <laughs> He's got a big smile on his face. He doesn't look scared of me. How about you? <laughs> It's funny, though, isn't it, right? Especially when we're by ourselves, right? And we can do all kinds of things when we're looking in the mirror. But you know what else the mirror reminds me of? It reminds me of God's love, how he loves everybody. Do you know that? He loves who? You. Every time you look in a mirror, every time you look in a mirror, remember that God loves everybody. You, you're very, very precious to him, all right? Okay, who has a memory verse? You got one? All right. Let's, what is it? Well, go ahead, read it. If you want to read it, read it. I forgot. You forgot. <laughs> okay, who else has got one here? Surely you got one. You got a favorite you got a favorite memory verse? Yeah. For God so loved oh, every every everyone you know that, right? 
whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. First Corinthians ten thirty one. All right, do all yeah, do all to the glory of God. Very good. All right. Anyone want to have prayer? Okay, go ahead. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Help us to know that we can trust you no matter what. Help us for loving us. Help us to know that we can trust you and help us to give everything to you and including our hearts and thank you for giving us life today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please stand and sing with me. My hope is built on nothing less. must have been God that invented prayer. A way that we have of communicating with him. Isn't that amazing? It's prayer time. If you'd like to come up and bring your requests, come up and pray up here. We'll pray for him. As many as possible, let us kneel for prayer. Most gracious Father in heaven, 
We thank you this morning for all that you have done for us, that we may have a hope of salvation, that we may understand your word for us, that you may draw us close to you and protect us from the problems of our world. We pray this morning for those that have asked an interest in our prayers, the prayer list, people that we have come in contact with, that look to you for help in this time of trouble. We pray this morning for our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, our kids, that you may draw them and us. Help us that we may be ready. We pray for those on our pray list, prayer list this morning, also in the prayer box. We pray this morning for our pastor as he breaks your word to us today. May it be your words. May we understand your plan for our lives. May we be ready for you when you come to save us. May that day be soon. For Jesus' sake, amen. We now worship the Lord with our gifts. And today the special offering is for local church budget. That means the budget takes care of all the needs of this, of this church. So I want to encourage you to give and to give as much as you can so that we could continue to run here as a church to uh, honor the Lord in this area so that one day he'd come to take us home. The deacon is now waiting us for tithes and our will offering, but let us bow our heads as we have a prayer together. Our Father God, we thank you for the privilege of giving, of returning to you some of what you have given to us, whether it's in tithes or whether it's in free will offerings. Bless these offerings, Father, and may they be used to glorify your name so that your kingdom could come and we could all be home to be with you forever. Is our prayer this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have a slight change in our program this morning, and the scripture, instead of being given by Scott McCrone, who is not around, is going to be given by John Wineland. You may, want, you may ask, well, who is John Wine, Wineland? Well, he is Amy's dad, and Robert, and the kids, that's Robert's father-in-law, and the children's grandpa, grandfather.
Well, my wife told me I better bring the uh, the Bible up here, <laughs> but I told her I didn't bring my glasses. I was going to have to depend on this device, and uh, wouldn't you know it disappeared before I got up here. But anyway, we'll find it here. <laughs> the scripture is Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Please remain seated while we sing. O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. Well, there's five things that God does not know, and I believe that you know what they are. Let's say them together. He does not know a sin he does not hate. He does not know a sinner he does not love. He does not know a heart he cannot change. He does not know a sin he cannot forgive, and he does not know a better time than now. Well, I've been preaching a little series here on the last day events and uh, preached uh, about um, the signs and the heavens and things of that nature. And I'm going to continue uh, that today, the signs of the times. Our name, Seventh Day Adventists. Seventh day means that we believe in the Bible Sabbath, right? We believe in the Bible Sabbath. And that's why we're here today. There are believers here that this is indeed a sacred day. We also believe in the second advent of Jesus, correct? And we've often said and trying to prepare people for the second coming that it's very soon. As that I pointed out last week, there are people who today believe in other theories and beliefs. But nevertheless, by looking at the signs of the times and Seventh-day Adventists have been preaching about this for well over 100 years, right? The second coming of Jesus. I also pointed out that every generation believes that their generation fits the description that Jesus gave of the end time events. Or as theologians call it, eschatology, which means end time events. Prophecy concerning the end time. 
the return of Jesus Christ. And so that there are many voices, however, who counter what Jesus said. They say that, well, you know that this earth was, came into existence through an evolutionary process. And it took millions of years. And there are scientists who actually believe that theory. Actually, it takes more faith to believe that than it does in a creator. Because they say this all started through one little chemistry, you know, thing of lightning and some proteins or something like that, you know. I mean, they have all kinds of theories. Or, and some of them believe that, well, you know, so many millions of years ago, our earth was visited by aliens from outer space. Probably from another galaxy even. And you know, they wanted to put life on this planet because they saw that life could exist here. And so they just dropped off a little piece of bacteria or something. And so it took millions of years through the evolutionary process. And finally, intelligence came, human beings. What a miracle that is, huh? But I think, and I believe, what the Bible says, that they are fools if they do not believe in the Creator. Because all of the evidence is there, and more evidence is shining forth every day that there is an intelligence behind this reality that we're living in. Every reality has some kind of intelligence behind it. That's what the natural rule tells me. I don't know about you, but that's what it tells me. Even before I was a Christian, even before I knew Jesus Christ, as a young person, as a child, I knew that these things did not just happen. And as I grew older, as a teenager, I was even more convinced that there has to be a creator God who created all of this. In other words, it was the Holy Spirit who was communicating with me and telling me, Norman, there is an intelligence behind this world, the creation of this world. It only makes common sense. How ridiculous it is for scientists to say that things just happened to be. They just came as a result of the evolutionary process. And looking around in our own solar system at Mars, and think, well, it once had water on it, that's what they're saying. And hopefully we will find some kind of maybe bacteria, some sign of life. I don't know. I've never been to Mars. You ever been to Mars? I really don't want to go to Mars. <laughs> so anyway, they have all of these theories. It's like looking, as I said before, and I say it again, it's like looking at the parking lot out here, and you see all of these automobiles, trucks, and you look and you say, hey, they just happened to be. They just came into existence. Isn't that marvelous? You look all the different kinds. Well, you have different kinds of animals, do you not? Different species, different kinds of animals. You have different kinds of trees. You have different kinds of bushes, different kinds of grasses, different kinds of flowers. You have all of those things. They just happen to be, well, the cars and the trucks, all of those just happened to come into existence. Do you believe that? They just didn't come through, come into existence through an evolutionary process, in other words. There is an intelligence behind that reality. And we all know that. There is an intelligence behind our telephones, right? Where's my telephone at? Right here it is. A computer. Can you imagine that? I could not imagine a telephone like this when I was young. Never thought I would have a computer with a phone. What would you do without your phone? But you know, it just happened to come into existence. I woke up one morning and there was a telephone. Wow. 
It's ridiculous. There is an intelligence behind the creation of this. It's called human. There is an intelligence behind the creation of this world, behind your creation and my creation, and it is God. He is the creator of all things. Now, with all of these voices crying out there, the scientists who are saying, and the evolutionary process, etc., and they say that, you know, the world is going to come to an end. The science tells us that. Oh, yeah, it's going to come to an end. It's not a matter of when or if, but just when, that the earth is going to be hit by some giant meteor, and that will be the end of life on planet earth. Or there will be some kind of a super volcano that will erupt and blow up. And that will be the end, end of all life on earth. That will be the end. You know, so we have all of these different voices crying out there, telling us how the world is going to end. We have tidal waves, they say, earthquakes, all of these things. It's a sign of the end. Jesus says that this is the sign of the end when you see these things on the increase. You see, among all of these voices out there, there is one voice in the storm that you can trust, and that's the voice of Jesus. You can trust his voice. You can trust the voice of God. Because he does not lie. I believe that. Don't you believe it? That's the truth. That is, is revealed in the scriptures. God does not lie. He is the creator of all things. Jesus had a lot to say about the future. He spoke about it. Signs of the times, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. He talked about the end, and he warned people. He scolded people if they did not know the signs of the, the, the times. I want you to look at Luke, Luke chapter 12. Luke in the 12th chapter, verse 56. You hypocrites, or you foolish people, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? Jesus says you are fools because you say that you can detect when it's going to rain by the clouds forming, right? You can look at that sign and you know, well, hey, it looks like a storm's coming. You can look at the seasons and know that spring is near or winter is near. So you have all of these signs that you are aware of and that, that, that you believe in. But I tell you this, that right now you do not believe in the signs that is right before you now. You do not believe in me, the Christ, the Son of the living God. I am the Messiah that was promised in the Old Testament. I am he that has come to give you life. But because they really misinterpreted Scripture and they had a warped concept of the character of God, they rejected him and even put him to death. And I wonder how many Christians today have a warped concept of Jesus, of God. How many Christians today are believing such things as I have described? Christians who are believing in flying saucers, for instance. The devil is setting the world up for the great, great deception as he impersonates Jesus Christ, as he impersonates the second coming of Jesus Christ. But God says, I want you to be ready. I want you to be aware of the signs of the times. Are we aware of those things, of the signs of the times that we're living in? Surely we can see that. Surely we can know that Jesus is coming very soon. He is. He says, be aware. Be awake. Because I come as a thief in the night. In other words, even Christians who love me will not know when I'm coming. You will not know, but I will come as a thief in the night. And we know that God says, I'm going to cut the last events, you know, I'm going to cut it short. We don't know the time. We don't know the date. 
God has not told us those things. Don't believe anybody who tells you otherwise. Be aware of these things that are taking place. You know, we can be calloused. We can become callous to these events. It's easy. We're, I mean, violence is all around us. It's every place. Wars and rumors of wars. We have the threat of nuclear war, right? It doesn't mean that, you know, there's not going to be a nuclear weapon set off someplace in this world. It may very well happen. We don't know. It could happen. But Jesus says in the storm, you can hear his voice. He says, I am in charge. I am the true voice. Listen to me and trust in me. And I will take you through every storm in life. No matter what it is. No matter how difficult time is for you. Isn't that right? God says, Jesus says, I am with you even to the end of the world. I am with you. No matter what crisis comes into your life, I will see you through that. I am with you. I will never leave you. Listen to me, he says, and trust in me. I will get you through this. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, ah, God's going to be with us, isn't he? God's going to be with you. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God's going to be with you. Makes no difference. He is our life, dear people. Something to be excited about. I, you know, I get excited. I'm preaching to the choir. Right now, you know, you all believe what I'm saying. Jesus is some, someone to get excited about. He's my Savior. Look, you know, I can just go on and on about that. I look forward. You see, here's one thing, dear people. When I get to heaven, there's not going to be any undertakers. Huh? No undertakers. No graveyards. Hey, all you people in the medical profession, not going to be any doctors, nurses, no hospitals. But there's going to be preachers. I'm going to keep preaching. <laughs> if God will allow me, I'm going to be traveling through the whole universe and telling my story. And so will you. Because you are a part of this big thing called, called redemption, called salvation. We have experienced something that the entire universe has never experienced. We know what it is to be lost and we know what it is to be saved. We know God in a different way and a much more intimate way than any intelligence in the universe. I believe that. Don't you? That's why God says, I'm going to bring my throne down here when I recreate this earth. I'm going to bring my throne down here, the new Jerusalem. And he says, I will indeed reign from there. And he says, there's no night or day there because God is there. His magnificent, his glistening glory lights up everything. I tell you, this is something, isn't it? God coming down and being with us. Because there is such an intimacy with us that there is not with any other creature in the universe that he's created. Now, that doesn't make us special either, does it? It makes us humble. It makes us humble. It should. We're not better than anybody else in the universe. But boy, do we have a mission. You know, then, I think about then, but I think about now. Men and women should hear this wonderful message. I want you to look again at our scripture reading, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews in the 10th chapter and verse 24, 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. In other words, we come to church to encourage one another. That's what Christians are to do, right? To encourage one another. It is through you that I gain strength. I look forward to coming here and fellowshipping with you. And do you know what? A preacher who, who's been to college, I have a B.A. in theology. I have a master's in <clears throat> divinity. Is there such a thing? Yes, I do. But listen, I learn a lot from you people. You know, you'd be amazed. Sometimes I just, I'm just, oh, I've never heard of that. That's a new thought, you know, that you come up with many times, you see. So we grow together, Right? We are to grow together spiritually. We are to become more like Jesus Christ. 
And that's why it's so important for us to come together. Listen to what he says here in verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of, of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as we see the day approaching, the day of our ultimate deliverance, dear people, is at hand. Jesus is coming. And it says, for don't forsake yourselves coming together. Come together now while we can. Press together. As you look and at, the, at the events taking place in this world, we know that the day is approaching, do we not? It is closer than it ever was. We are living in that generation. I don't know when Jesus is coming. I wouldn't tell you that he's coming in five years. I wouldn't tell you he's coming in 50 you know, some Christians may think that it's not important, these last time events, it's not important. But it is important, or Jesus wouldn't emphasize it so much. He wouldn't have emphasized it so much. It is, a, it is important. Forsake your not for the assembling of yourselves together. I mean, come together, he says, and worship together, be together. Listen, every Sabbath, the scripture says, Isaiah 66, from one Sabbath to another and from one new moon to another shall all flesh come before me, saith the Lord. If we're going to do it in heaven and that's where we want to go, then we better be practicing it right now, right? We should be practicing it right now. Coming together, worshiping God. This is a blessed experience, coming together and worshiping him, coming together and exhorting one another and encouraging one another in the Christian faith and helping one another. I want you to look at John chapter 16. And this is another chapter. Jesus is talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He's going to be leaving. He's going to be leaving. So he talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He talks about he's going away to the Father. It's actually about his death and his resurrection and so forth. But here he is in John chapter 16 and verse 33. He says, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's his voice speaking to us. That's his voice speaking to the whole world. No matter what you see, these events that are taking place, he says, be of good cheer. Huh? Can you be of good cheer? That's what Jesus says, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Because I have overcome the world. You're going to overcome the world. And I'm going to be with you. I will take you through every difficulty in your life, no matter what it is. You just trust in me, believe in me. I'll take care of your problems. Anything that you need, you ask the Father, he says, and he'll give it to you. Now, he doesn't say when he's going to give it to us, right? <laughs> that doesn't mean praying for new cars and all that kind of stuff. He just promises, I'll give you what you need. I'll give you what you need. Not what you want necessarily, but I'll give you what you need. And sometimes he even gives us what we want. <laughs> right he does it's amazing our heavenly father is just so tremendous hey you know this wonderful message that we have a seven day adventists this beautiful gospel that we have we need to be proclaiming it with power and great glory and that only comes by the outpouring of the holy spirit in our lives the only way we really lack that. We really do need it. Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Hard times are coming. Really hard times are coming. I want you to look at Matthew, or Daniel. And Daniel and chapter, the last chapter of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. And I want you to look at uh, the last, uh, or the first few verses here. Of, of Daniel chapter 12. And he says this, at that time shall Michael stand up. Who is Michael? A lot of Christians say, when you say that's Jesus, and really it's prophetically proven. I mean, you can prove it from Scripture that he is called Michael. Uh, some Christians don't believe that. You know, well, it's not Michael, it's an angel. But no, it's Michael. Shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. Who's standing for us? Is it an angel? Is it Gabriel? 
Who's standing for us? Who's representing us? Jesus. So he is Michael. I don't have time to go into that to prove that. Maybe someday I will. And there shall be a time of trouble, he says, such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book, the book of life. Your name is written there, dear people. Your name is in the book of life. Cheer up, Jesus says. Cheer up. No matter how hard times get, I'm going to be with you. I'm never going to leave you. Just trust in me. Have faith in me. And I'll take you through. I'll take you through this time of trouble. And he goes on to say this. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. I thought everyone went to heaven when they died. No. No. Everyone is really dead. Their whole identity, who they are, is in the mind of God. And to them who sleep in the Lord Jesus, there is no consciousness. There is no awareness of any passing of time. The moment they close their life in death, they wake up and there is Jesus. No matter if it's been a 1,000 years or 2,000 or 5,000 years, there is Jesus. There is no passing of time for them. But Jesus has your identity in his mind right now. God has you in his mind. Never forget that. Jesus says that I am the resurrection and the life, and when I come back, I will resurrect the dead in Christ. And he says, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and that they, uh, they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That's it. That's the beauty of the gospel. There is hope, dear people, eternal life in Jesus Christ, and he is the only one that you will find eternal life in. He is the only voice that you must listen to. Don't listen to the other voices out there. Don't listen to the so-called evidence, but listen to what Jesus says in the scriptures. Listen to what God says throughout the scriptures. The gospel, you see, the good news that's what is it all about Jesus, isn't it? It's about the character of God, of really knowing him. That's what we are to be about as Seventh-day Adventists. We are to be preaching Jesus Christ. And we are to draw closer and closer to him so that people will recognize the character of God in our lives. I believe that. It doesn't mean that Norman Bassett is ever going to be perfect in this world. Jesus is my righteousness. He is my salvation. He is my everything. He is my life. He has my heart, and I have his heart. That's the way it should be. Seventh-day Adventists should be a people, if we really believe that we have a special message to give to this world, then there should be a difference here in the life of Seventh-day Adventist Christians, right? There should be. And I'm telling you, that's what God wants us to proclaim to the entire world about him. That's what the gospel is all about, dear people. It's about God. It's about his character. Good will, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. That's what God is saying. I did not come here to condemn, Jesus said. I came to save you. I came to save the world. That's what he says. And there is hope, yes. It's just not only the forgiveness of sins, but there is a change in the heart. There's a change in the human nature when we come to Christ and give our lives to him. Amen. That's what the world has to understand. He alone can deliver us from this world of sin and degradation. He alone can give us eternal life. 
And he promises that. To you who love me, I give you eternal life. Lo, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man and woman what they deserve, <laughs> right? How can people reject such great salvation is beyond me. I don't understand it. But I believe that in the, all of this dark, darkened world, there is a light shining even now. And it is the truth about God and what he is all about. And that he, Jesus Christ, is coming back very, very soon. He is going to put an end to all the sickness and suffering it will never be again. The reality of this world will soon be over and we'll be in another reality. It will be an eternal reality. And we will live with God forever and ever and ever. I want to see every one of you there. Let's get busy. What do you say? Let's get serious. Let's get serious and do all that we can for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Please stand and sing with me. He lives. Hymn number 251.
Heavenly Father, we're so thankful and grateful to you once again for the tremendous love that you have for us. Lord, we cannot begin to comprehend it. We cannot begin to understand it. But we do know it exists because we have experienced and you truly do live in our hearts. Father, I pray that each of us will continue in our journey, in our spiritual journey, and that, Lord, that we might indeed, by beholding you, reflect the beautiful graces that we see in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now may your eyes be lifted up and may you behold the glorious figure of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and may you be ever drawn to him. May his peace and may his joy and may his love rest upon you both now and forever. Amen. dismissed.